So, what a delight to be here. Uh, wonderful, my fellow panelists who are uh, just great leaders in this space, and there are some great leaders out there, which, which is great. So, I'm going to tell you about a social capital part, about the journey, uh, because there's lots of lessons in that. And doing this in 10 minutes will be a challenge to me, so I'm sure I'm going to get the gong uh, before you know, too long. But I will try and go through this as quickly as possible, because I think there are some really interesting, you know, the, 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 the road to being a social entrepreneur has many twists and turns, and many unexpected twists and turns. And, and the, the funny thing about doing it in 10 minutes is you're probably going to be under the mistaken impression after 10 minutes that we actually know what we're doing, because I'll be talking about our successes. If I had three hours, I could tell you about our failures, which, which are. So, so, so it's, it's, this will make it look like we, we know what we're doing, but, but, but it's, it, in many ways that journey is anything but. And, and there are so many interesting pivot points. Why don't I get into the story? So, we were formed in 2001. I am one of these lucky people in life who happened to be in the right place at the right time in the private sector. My ship came in realized the Wheel of Fortune has spun awfully well for me. It sure doesn't spin well for everyone. And how could I take my business experience and leverage it and do good? And why had we divided this world into uh, this oxymoronish thing that, you know, the private sector does this, the non-profit sector does this, the government does this, and there's no intersection between them. And it seemed pretty obvious in 2001 it seems a lot more obvious in 2013 that we as a society need to find new models for solving our structural social challenges. This notion that governments write checks and solve structural social challenges, that didn't look sustainable in 2001. It sure doesn't look sustainable in 2013. So we really needed to find new sustainable models that, that, uh, to solve our structural social challenges. So we said, why don't we try that? Why don't we pick the issue of finding meaningful employment for people who face employment barriers, and why don't we try and solve that in, in a sustainable way? And we're now in phase three of that work. We've always been focused on how do you find meaningful employment opportunities. Phase one was very much what we're talking about here, social enterprise, in, in sort of this definitional sense. Why don't we help start up businesses that do this as part of their design, that provide employment opportunities to people who are uh, from disadvantaged populations, but also uh, create a business product or service with the idea of being profitable. Again, actually the part I like talking about the most, probably emotionally the best part of what we've done. I sadly, if I'm going to get through this story, uh, can't spend time on it. Um, but suffice to say, uh, where's, there's a, uh, we played a sort of a social venture capital role where we would help finance uh, the business, uh, take a board seat, and try and do what a venture capital does, see how we could help the business develop and grow. Of the ones that we financed today, uh, there are four of them, range from a property management company in Vancouver that employs uh, women who are victims of violence, a renovation company in Winnipeg that employs urban aboriginals, a bicycle courier company here called Turnaround Couriers, any of you who are that hires directly from youth shelters, and uh, 11 thrift stores in Montreal uh, called Renaissance Quebec that um, operates under free to pay. Uh, together, they are all profitable um, and uh, uh, provide employment today for about five or 600 people. So, wonderful model. I'm leaving out, surprise, surprise, of failures. Um, but when we got to year five, uh, we stepped back and said, where are we? And we said, where we are is, uh, on the one hand, we've proven one of the things you want, we want to prove. You can make these double bottom line companies work. They can work financially, they can be sustainable and profitable. They can work socially. They can transform lives. But on the other hand, it took us five years to provide then 300 odd jobs. And we said, what's 300 odd jobs in the global scheme of things? It's not much. And we got into this change of landscape. And what we are is an interesting magazine article. People like to pat us on the head, tell us to keep up the good work. Um, uh, but it's not, they don't think it relates to what they're doing. So we said to ourselves, how do we change the landscape? And we said, if we're going to change the landscape, we've got to do two things. One, we've got to engage the private sector in what we're doing. And two, we got to make this more cookie cutter, because startups are hard, startups are even harder, uh, arguably, with this model. Again, that led us to phase two, long story, but the short story is we said private sector cookie cutter, what about franchising? Why don't we go to established franchisors with this value proposition, which was, we said, we'll provide startup capital to a business person who wants to buy one of your, uh, one of your locations. We'll make it subordinate to any of their bank debt. We'll do it at attractive rates, but to get our money, they got to implement a community hiring program. 
uh, where they've got to <laughs> agree to hire a fixed number of their employees through our community hiring group. But we said our promise back to that business owner is we'll get them a competitive pool of candidates to choose from. And if we don't deliver on that promise, uh, they don't have to deliver on their promise to hire that fixed number. And we said they're the sole judge of whether or not we've delivered on that promise. So we effectively guarantee uh, the product. Again, long story short, uh, today we've done more than 50 of those uh, franchise locations, mostly in the car service area. Active Green and Ross, Mr. Lube are our biggest. We like that car service model because you don't need that many skills to change oil, although as I joke, it immediately eliminates me. <laughs> but you can work your way to being a licensed mechanic. So we like that uh, career path. But so, so we thought that was the idea. We get hundreds of franchises, thousands of jobs. Um, but a couple things happened that made us realize the idea could be much bigger, and that's led us to phase three where we are now. Um, and, and essentially, rather than going into those two things, we learned two things from doing this franchise business. One, employers would do this if someone made this easy for them. And two, it's friggin' difficult. The reason it's friggin' difficult for them is because, back to business speak, of the way product gets to market. The product being a job-ready individual who faces an employment barrier, market being an entry-level job in a company that has a good career path, product gets to market in Canada through literally thousands of community service agencies whose training and background is as social workers. Uh, they don't speak the language of business. They naturally think their customer is the individual they're trying to find employment for, but not the employer. And they think they're in a transaction relationship with that employer, where they send their candidates get at the wall to all the job postings out there, rather than in a strategic relationship with that employer, where they say, uh, what makes for a successful entry-level employee at your business? Where are your pain points? We're going to solve those pain points. And again, it, it, when, when we looked at it, we realized we're playing a band-aid. We play the interface between community service agencies and the business owners. But what if we could fix the system? And we looked into the system more, and again, this is an oversimplification, trying to get through this in 10 minutes. But in effect, we realized the system has never looked at the employer as a customer in the system. The system has never realized that if we don't turn this into an employer-friendly channel to hire from, it doesn't matter what we do on the supply side of the equation, we're going to have a very suboptimal system. And so, uh, and there's... Plenty of evidence of that. We spend billions of dollars in Canada around employment training. Employers aren't involved in the design of that training. That training isn't formally linked to where our future workforce development needs, or shortages are going to be. Uh, very little of funding, virtually none of funding, is actually tied to successful employment outcomes. And a successful employment outcome is what both the supply side, the person seeking a job wants to find, an employer where they can stay at and progress at, and the employer wants to hire people who will stay and progress. But we haven't, we haven't done it. So, so we have a system that's completely what we would call supply-based as opposed to demand-based. And we have, uh, well, I won't get into statistics because I'm sure I'm not that far from the from the top. But, but so, we say to ourselves, oh, how do we change the system? I mean, we can we can point out uh, the weaknesses system, but, but uh, you, know, you know, trying to get the government to make a big system change, how do we do that? We also, the other part of the story I should tell you, is what made us realize that opportunity and the size of it is we were on a call at Canadian Tire trying to get them to uh, buy into our franchise program, which we failed to do, but we also met the fellow who runs the whole distribution operation at Canadian Tire. And we took them through our story, how we work with Active Green Ross, how we play this interface, how we get the employer as the customer, how we make sure we solve their problems. At the end of it, he said, well, we employ 4,000 people at our two distribution centers here in Brampton. We get this community engagement stuff. It's in our DNA. We support all kinds of charities in Brampton. We get involved in the community. It never occurred to me to think about this through an employment lens. This makes so much sense. It's almost as if you want to say, so when do we, when do we get going? And of course, we're thinking to ourselves, well, we know how to find four people for our active Green Ross franchise <laughs> here in Brampton. Uh, we don't have a clue how to find 4,000. But we realized, wow, what an opportunity. But when we probe more with Canadian Tire, we found out none of those 4,000 employees actually become Canadian Tire employees until they've been there a year. Before that, they're ADECO employees. ADECO is this large private sector staffing company that says to Canadian Tire, we'll hire pickers, receivers, shippers, forklift drivers. We'll put our managers on site to deal with the HR issues. We'll put them on our payroll, we'll transfer them to your payroll until they've proven themselves in your environment. 
And we go, wait a second, no community service agent put 4,000 people on their payroll. No newfangled social capital partners gets why dots aren't getting connected. We can't put 4,000 people on our payroll. And meanwhile, there are organizations out there that place millions of people globally that have no interface with this channel. How do we get it so the monsters of the world or the Adecos and the Randstads and the Manpowers have a community hiring division five or ten years from now? They've got that. You know, what's so hard, for instance, for a large bank right now to implement a community hiring program, if you want to do one as a large bank, you've got to deal with a different community <coughs> service agent in Hamilton, Oakville, Oshawa, Burlington, Scarborough, let alone Red Deer, Lethbridge, Moose Jaw, etc. So what we've realized in the system is, holy smokes, so there's a system with four actors. <coughs> How am I doing? Keep it rolling, baby. It's good. Keep it going. Four actors, uh, employers, community service agencies, the government, the way they fund uh, the business, and staffing agencies and or other uh, supply uh, possibilities. And we say, they've all got to look different five or ten years from now. We have, you know, if we're going to make this system, uh, look. So we put in a plan, and this is what phase three is, where we say, okay, we're going to put together a plan for each of those actors and try and, it's a spaghetti at the wall where we try and, See if we can engage them, change the behavior, and then we go where we get traction. See if we can do it. And so again, long story on terms of how we do that. But I'll tell you one of the re areas we have traction is the government. Um, and the reason we have traction in the government is because we realized we weren't the right people to approach the government in the long run. Um, and and you know, in fairness to the government, you know, through one lens it sounds well, how could you not take into account the employer? This is the way most governments have approached this. And through another lens, it makes total sense. Because what governments have said to themselves is, oh my goodness, we've got a whole bunch of people out there who face employment barriers that need help overcoming those employment barriers before they can get a job. And the needs of a single mom are different from the needs of a new immigrant, are different from the needs of an at-risk youth, are different from the needs of someone with a physical or mental disability. So we've got to contract with specialists in those fields who understand that population's employment barriers and have the specialized skills to help them overcome, which needs to be done. It's absolutely true. The part that doesn't work, though, is, you know, and what we're hoping to do in the systems change is how do you decouple what community service agents are really good at from the parts that they aren't as good at? And how do we find scaled organizations that can make those jobs at Canadian Tire available to this channel, which aren't available now? So, Again, I won't tell you what we're doing with all those actors, uh, but it is, it's been, in, it's involved going and having discussions with the staffing agencies, and, and it's involved <coughs> talking with employers. But with the government, what we did was we said, well, we can point out, you know, where, the, the, why this is, why we need to change uh, the system. We can point out statistics like, and again, this is a gross oversimplification, but in Ontario, almost 50% of the people on social assistance who get a job are back on social assistance within a year. And, and it's more complicated than saying that matching mechanism you know, needs to work. But that supply-demand interface is one of the real issues behind it. Imagine if we got that down to 15%, just in terms of taxpayer savings, let alone the hundreds of thousands of job opportunities we could make available from a social impact standpoint. So we say to ourselves, well, we can point out why this needs to be done, but if the government has to make a big system change, who do they turn to? Well, they turn to the IBMs, the KPMGs, the Deloitte's. So we went to Deloitte's and said, Deloitte's, we need you to commit to a five-year pro bono relationship with us. Here's, here's the social impact this idea could have. Here's the taxpayer savings. Here's why this is up your alley. You won't find a better CSR opportunity. Uh, you, but, and, and you won't find, no false modesty here, a better nonprofit to partner with than us. But then we said, but if what you really want to do is have your, non, your pro bono consulting area help us think through this for five years, that's not what we're looking for. We actually want you to see the business opportunity here. Because we want you to be the experts in what demand-driven systems change would look like, not us. We want this to go out your <laughs> brand, not our brand. It'll have way more impact with the key actors in this thing. And, oh, by the way, if you're going to become an expert, better implement the community hiring program. So. But anyway, we said, here's how we get started. Let's do a white paper on what a demand-driven system would look like. Identify the taxpayer savings, the, the uh, and social impact, uh, you know, everything that would need to be done. What are the characteristics of the demand-driven system? How, how do you turn this into an employer-friendly channel? What, what would that look like? And two, let's see if we can do a couple demonstration projects for provincial governments, where we say to them, look, let us design a demonstration project in a way that we think, if you could have a blank piece of paper, it would be designed. And let's make that from the demand side and work backwards. So where do we know there are going to be meaningful entry-level jobs in the future? 
What sectors are those in? We'll go get 10 employers from those sectors to commit to 10 community hires a year for five years. So we'll have a cohort, not, not large numbers, but we'll have a cohort of 100 uh, hires every year. And we'll get those employers to commit to tracking the employment outcomes of that 100 versus the employment outcomes they're getting hiring the, that same position from other channels. Because our goal is to make sure their employment outcomes are as good or better. So every year, we'll iterate through the whole supply side value chain based on the results from the intake to the assessment to the pre-employment training to the placement to the post-employment support provided to all our candidates through the employer's eyes with the data to say, okay, in this first cohort, what were they missing? Where's the leverage? Where do you think the intervention should be here? And let's go test that and then work that with the second cohort. And we have, and it's a long story, we have Ontario and Manitoba effectively signed up to work through that uh, with us. So that's, I mean, our interesting journey, and sorry this took longer than it should have, and I've left out a whole bunch, and I've tried to speak really fast. Um, but it's interesting our journey has gone from, you know, a purpose-built phase one, where we say, no, the solution is to build a customized type of organization that addresses this, Two A and phase three, a reverse engineer <laughs> strategy. Like, how do we take the system that's out there? And we've gone from an ownership model, and not really an ownership model, is that model we ever owned anything? But, but this notion that we would, you know, sit on boards, we'd get on, you know, we'd get involved to this. No, let's not own any of it. And who should own it? And how do we engage them? Like, why don't we find an already scaled business rather than having to figure out how to scale this ourselves? and figure out how to give it to them, you know, and show them the business opportunity that they might not see otherwise. And that's, you know, gets into the story of how we're working with staffing agencies and those kinds of things. And it's actually hugely liberating. The last thing I'll close with that's been a real lesson for me, I come from the private sector, I come from sort of thinking about an ownership model, hugely liberating, not wanting to own anything. Um, you know, and we, even in, in part of our proposal to the government, we said, uh, we're not going to charge you for our services because we said, we actually have no interest in running a demonstration project for you. Paradoxically, it creates, you know, you know everyone thinks, well, I can't give up ownership because you're giving up power. Well, it's very perverse but, but, and paradoxical, but, but actually somehow, you know, there is huge freedom in, in not wanting to own. So it's been a fascinating journey with lots of pivot points, but that gives you sort of a reflection of what a, what a journey can be, and, and anyway, I recommend it to awesome. anyone, uh, and I'll show you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much.